Hello, I am Marianna Haye and I'm a visual artist from Oslo. I led the Memorial Committee for Utøya until its completion last summer. I am not a member of the Labour Party and I had, I had never been part of the AUF, its youth organization, which was attacked for political reasons on the 22nd of July 2011. In fact, I had never been to Utøya before taking on this assignment. To work on this project and with the people involved has been an immense honor. And here I will try to concentrate on the process in a kind of pra pragmatical and clear manner as far as I can. Uh, so, first of all, it's important to clarify that leasing, which is the title for the memorial at Utøya, means clearance, is placed on the actual site of the attack, as you can see here, that's Utøya. Um, on the island itself, where 69 people, most of them young, were killed. The island is private property owned by AUF and almost every inch of it is a crime scene. Death is present everywhere on the island. This is actually where these people were killed. It's where the horror happened. So it's obviously a very different task to build a memorial on Utøya than to build one on land at Sørbrotten, the national memorial close by. You see, it's up there, then we will. Now, we saw these two memorials as fulfilling each other. They actually look at each other geographically. And we thought of them as covering different functions and needs in the aftermath of the terrorist attack of 22nd of July. They were not competing, nor intended to do so, and that's important, I think, to say. The mandate we received from AUF initially indicated a process towards an artwork, probably some kind of monument, to represent the horrors of what had happened. But after talking to the bereaved, we very soon decided to abandon the idea of anything that could be described as a conventional artwork. It just didn't seem like there was any space for it. This was not an occasion for art production. Someone who has experience to carry the weight of his or her own dead child does not need anyone or anything to interpret or represent that feeling, to give it a form. It's really, really... This form is already and always there in their body. The weight and the image of the unthinkable loss forever etched into it. One parent said every time he blinked, he saw the same thing. He could never look away, never rest. It was like a continuous, uninterrupted projection. And I think no image can ever compete with that one. It is like the image of images. Everything else is simply dwarfed by it less true, less urgent, less horrible, and less significant. So we decided to work with architects instead of artists and to ask them specifically not to try to illustrate or represent the horror. So therefore, listening is not a representation of bereavement, but more like a structure to frame it, a screen onto which it can be projected. It is a space, empty but intimate and protected, built by the bereaved and the survivors themselves, and this is a Norwegian tradition called Dugina, which is very hard to translate properly into any other language, um, where this nameless emotion can be projected and shared. It's a space for the image of what is no longer there, and that image we felt was best taken care of by respecting its very absence, its very incommunicability. 
So this is not supposed to help the national, more abstract and distant pain. For that, there would be the national memorials, but to offer an intimate, private and protected space for those directly affected. It's their place. So this memorial listening is Utøya's own, decided upon and built by its users, placed where the attack happened, accessible to everyone, but built on private land on the island, so you can only get there by boat. It is apolitical in order to accommodate mourners also of different political views than the one under attack. Because the attack was politically motivated, but losing a child, a friend or a loved one is not a political issue. That's an intimate personal one. The way I see it, the process that led to the final result of the memorial is far more important than its physical, beautiful, but still quite modest and pragmatic outcome. It is now a much loved and much used memorial thanks to a good design concept, but maybe even more thanks to the enormous emotional and personal investment from both the bereaved, the survivors, AUF and many others who are sympathetic to Utøya and the project and, to, and who took part both in the development of the concept and the actual building of the memorial. They own it and they are proud of it. Huge amounts of time and effort were put into the communication with future users during the process, with several platforms <coughs> for contact. More than 600 emails with questions and inputs were read, discussed and answered by our committee, and we traveled all over the country to talk about it and discuss various models, solutions, needs and wishes with local groups, because the victims came from all over Norway. We invited people to, and also abroad actually, we invited people to vote on specific questions regarding the form of the memorial, such as the inclusion or not of the names of the victims, and also on the choice of the site. We had five, I think, five pos possible spots on the islands where it could be. And here I must say the director of Utøya, who also served as secretary for the committee, did a formidable job. And all this feedback collected served as our main tool in informing the architects before the competition and also in finally selecting a winner. And we also thought it was in itself a way to process what had happened and develop a, a set of tools or notions, some kind of vocabulary to reach beyond the words normally at our disposal and in this situation so terribly insufficient. So, even though we could not accommodate every individual wish or request, we made sure every voice was heard and every question answered in the process. These conversations, presentations, discussions and sometimes conflicts were important in themselves. Anchoring the memorial with its future users was our main concern. AUF's budget, based on their savings and on private donations, was 500,000 kroners, all included. This was a very small budget, considering the size of the project, the nature of the process, and the quality required from the final result. We knew it would barely cover materials and travel costs for the memorial committee. We all agreed to work for free, but we decided to apply to Kuro for 200,000 to cover the honorarium for the four teams of young architects participating in the competition. Everything else, including the construction work, would be done for free. I submitted an application to Kuro after thoroughly discussing it with Kuro's own advisors. And what followed was a curious exchange of opinions that went on for several months and which I f still find hard to understand. It's a bit intricate, so in order for you to be able to fo follow, I have invited actor Ole Sjeldred to read it with me. So on the 15th of, of April, I received a phone call from Kuro. 
Yes, hello. Um, I give Marianne the happy news that our artistic committee has reviewed and anonymously approved of the application she sent in for AUF. Our committee has recommended that Kuru go all in and grant AUF the full amount of 200,000 kronos that they asked for, and I tell her we find the project important. Marianne says, thank you, this is great news. Thank you. I tell her, however, that for strategic reasons, Kuro will hold back the decision since it might disturb the process of the state's national memorial at Sörbot nearby, for which Kuro is responsible. So this is all kind of off the record, off the record even though the normal bureaucratic processing is finalized and the decision has been made. I say it is only a matter of time and that processing is, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, and that of course Kuru is entirely positive and sympathetic to AUF's project. So she can pass the good news on to AUF and the bereaved. But I ask her not to go public with it since the situation concerning, concerning the National Memorial is such a delicate matter at the moment. After all, this is a very uncommon project. Luckily, not something we treat every day. She understands and happily accepts our conditions, of course. And eight weeks later, I have not heard anything more, so I send this email. Dear Kuro, both AUF and I would very much like to know how things are going with our application for the memorial at Utøya. So maybe you could email me a short update on the status of the process? As I said on the phone, neither AUF nor I are interested in any public controversy over this, so we will treat any information confidentially. But the memorial is almost completed now, so it would be nice with some clarity around the economy. Thank you. Sincerely, Marianne. Hi, Marianne. We are actually in the same situation. We are also waiting for a clarification. The state's processing of the plan for the National Memorial has been postponed. This means we don't know when there will be a decision regarding the start up of the construction works for the memorial on Sörbotten. Therefore, we also don't know whether the neighbors will actually be suing the state as they say they will. I'm only speculating, but my guess is there will be quite some time before we reach a solution. All Kuro applications have been treated in complete transparency. The most realistic option now would be that we conclude the process and reject your application so AUF can look for alternative financial solutions. Best regards, Kuru. Hello again, Kuru. Thanks for your reply, although I must admit that this is surprising and sad news. You told me on the phone that the application had been reviewed with a positive result by your artistic committee, but that it was put on hold for strategic reasons. You said yourself that everyone at Kuru was positive and determined to support the project, and that I could pass that message on to AUF. I had a clear understanding that it was only a matter of time. I understand, of course, that there are difficulties with the National Memorial, but as it looks now, it appears that Kuro, a state agency, has decided to put a non-political memorial made by and for the bereaved after tw 22nd of July aside in favor of a national state-owned memorial with a completely different mandate and funding, and that this is due to strategic, not artistic reasons. Nobody is interested in any conflict around this, least of all the bereaved and directly affected by the attack. As you can imagine, they are still trying to recover from the traumas of what they have had to go through. So I ask you to confirm that I have understood this correctly before I pass on any more bad news to them. Best regards, Marianne.
as I said in the conversation you are referring to, the processing of the application was postponed because we cannot decide to support it before we have received go for the construction of the memorial at Sobotten. We were expecting clarifications on this matter this spring. Decisions on regulation and building permits are postponed and we expect that it may take time before we reach a solution. These are processes upon which Kuru has no influence. The only correct solution at this point would be that, as I explained in my last message, we now conclude the process and communicate a formal refusal to AUF so that they can start looking for alternative financial support. Our formal decision will be communicated in the usual way. It is true that our artistic committee was positive to the project and I also have great sympathy for it. I'm probably no happier with the consequences than you are. If you are interested, we are happy to talk about possible alternative sources of funding. Best regards, cool. Hello again, Kuru. What I don't quite understand is what all this has to do with the National Memorial at Sørbrotten. Our application is for the memorial at Utøya. It is both a different project and a different site. Best, Marianne. <coughs> Hello again. <coughs> Hello again. I can explain this to you if you call me or drop by the office. Kuru. Hello again. I must say I find this procedure very strange. But as you know, this is not my project. I have simply submitted an application on behalf of AUF. I think now the right thing is to hand the matter over to them and they can decide for themselves whether they need any further clarifications regarding the connection between the memorial at Utøya and the project for Söderotten. Best regards and have a nice weekend, Marianne. P.S. I am copying the director of Utøya, who also coordinates the work on the memorial and was involved in writing the application. Hi. With a copy to the director of Utøya. My answers to your messages were intended as information for you to, on how things are going in order for you to be able to pass realistic information on to AUF. The formal processing of the application will be finalized on Tuesday in the coming week and the results communicated in the usual way in form of a letter. The director of Utøya and AUF are of course welcome to contact us for any questions they might have. Regards, Kubo. But then, out of the blue, 11 days later, Kuro writes back again. Hi, Marianne. For your information, we have found a solution that allows us to grant the application for funding for the memorial at Utøya. Please feel free to inform AUF about this. A letter confirming the decision will be sent tomorrow. With best regards, Kuro. Thank you. <laughs> Where's the last picture? Uh, obviously, a lot of things went on behind the scene here. You were supposed to see the final result now of the memorial process. Can you find it for me? There, yeah. Obviously, a lot of things went on behind the scene here. And I am not even really sure whose voice or whose interests were actually on the other side of this exchange. It ended well. And I am extremely grateful to Kuro for the support they gave us for the memorial at Utøya. I also have great respect for the people who work for Kuro. They are highly competent, courageous, intelligent people with great integrity, able to organize things like this conference. So this exchange, most of all, I think, show how fragile things are when they are under pressure in the aftermath of something as horrible as the 22nd of July. It's really, really easy 
to make a wrong step. And for a moment, it actually seemed that Kuru, a state agency for public art, was willing to sacrifice the interests of the bereaved in order to secure political interests. I have to say here that it's important that you understand that the application was already accepted. It had been processed and accepted. So there were other reasons for why it should not be granted. It's hard not to notice the power game played out here, and personally, I find it quite disturbing. The feeling of a conflict of interest between the state on the one hand and the victims of 22nd of July on the other that comes through in the mails from Kuru is something I still find very difficult to accept and to understand. In the middle of all the public discourses of more democracy, more transparency, more solidarity, more love, more openness in the aftermath of the attacks, I really find this strange. There is a lot to say about this. It's a question of power and transparency and justice and decency, and about whose voices are heard and who owns the right to define history. Personally, I sincerely hope that Kuru will be able to build a national memorial at Söderbrotten. It would be an important place for people like me, people who were lucky enough not to be directly affected by the terrible things that happened on the 22nd of July, by this terrible attack. We need a national memorial. Listening is there for those who carry the experience of the attack in their own bodies. It's not competing with a national memorial. That's important. One of the bereaved said that the price for love is grief, and that the, she thought it was worth it even though it was a terrible price to pay. She would do it all over again. Listening is a place of love and grief, of solidarity, dignity and of not giving up. Thank you.